Hi, this is Mrs. Robel. This video is the Chapter 3 Matter, Property, and Changes Review. I just want to go over this um, flow chart with you because this pretty much summarizes what we've learned. Please remember that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space or volume. Now we have two types of matter, so please understand there's two major types. There's pure substances, which we've talked about in the beginning, and then mixtures. Now notice that when you're looking at pure substances versus mixtures, the way that you can separate out those two types of matters is through physical changes. So you're changing the state of the substance or matter to help separate out different uh, components. Now here we have under substances, we have elements and compounds. And remember, um, diatomics are considered elements. So O2 is a diatomic. Uh, gold by itself, that is considered an element, and obviously iron is. Now with compounds, it has to be two or more different atoms. So salt is a compound. Baking soda, um, Na. HCO3. Notice that there's several elements in that one compound. So if you see two or more different element symbols, that's a good gauge that it is a compound. Now notice that if you want to separate out a compound, you probably have to use chemical changes. And we did that in that one lab. Um, we took the copper sulfate and we heated it and we actually removed water. So we were able to separate out a compound from that element. Um, also, we added acid, hydrochloric acid, to magnesium metal. And we were able to separate out a compound doing it that way. Now, under mixtures, we have two types. We have heterogeneous and we have homogeneous. So notice with homogeneous, we have things like lemonade or steel. It doesn't all have to be liquid. It could be a solid. Um, another term for homogeneous is solution, and it has to be all the same phase. So if you take a cross-section of it, they should all look the same. If they don't, they're like my lava lamp, and we're talking about a heterogeneous solution. Dirt, blood, milk are all types of heterogeneous solutions. Okay. So we have metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. And I just wanted to show you the periodic table one more time just to illustrate that when we're looking at metals, it's a good chunk of the periodic table. So wherever you see blue, that is a metal. Metalloids, we are looking at the elements that are located along the step stair. And then nonmetals are essentially in this hot corner. Now I just want to highlight here that this group of elements here are the diatomics. So we have N2, O2, F2, just to um, give you some examples. We also have hydrogen. Hydrogen would be H2. Okay, mixtures. So as I mentioned before, um, the types we can have is heterogeneous or homogeneous. Notice homogeneous, they're also called solutions. They have to be uniformly mixed. They're two or more substances. Heterogeneous, we have two or more that are not uniformly mixed. So when you look at the layers, they look different than each other. For instance, I talked about the, the Szechuan pepper salt. Okay, properties of matter. So properties of matter we're looking at physical characteristics. So notice that there's no loss of identity, and it is a unique property to that substance. So we're typically looking at phase. A lot of the elements that are located in the periodic table tend to be solids. There's only two that are actually liquid, and those two are mercury and bromine. Notice that Another physical property would be color that is unique to that substance. When we're looking at boiling point or melting point, those are specific to that type of substance. Okay, here we go. Chemical change. 
So when we're looking at chemical change, um, we've got a number of ways that we can determine whether or not a chemical change has occurred. The first thing is evolution of gas. But please remember, we are not talking about boiling. Boiling is not a chemical change. It's a physical change because we're going from a, a liquid to a gas. We may have formation of an odor, and it has to be a new odor. And remember, you want to waft it so that you're not... Um, assaulting your respiratory system. Um, you will have formation of a precipitate. So you did in your lab the addition of silver nitrate with the um, salt water and you got a solid heat. So if you see release of heat, burning a candle is an example of um, a chemical change. And then lastly we have color change. So color change, it's a good rule of thumb that we're looking at a chemical change. But be careful because going from a solid wax to a liquid wax, you do see a color change, but that's just a phase change. Okay, let's go over some of these examples together just to be sure. Dry ice sublimes. So we have carbon dioxide and it goes from a solid phase to a gaseous phase. So the question is, is that a chemical change? No, it's a physical change because you're changing your state. Okay, a penny tarnishes. So copper is typically like a, a reddish brown color and over time it actually can turn green like the Statue of Liberty. Is that a chemical change? Yes. Ice cream melting. So you go from a solid cream to a liquid cream, is that a chemical change? No, because you're going from one phase to the other. And then lastly, rock, solid rock being ground into tiny bits of sand, is that a chemical change? No, because it's just like when you ground the copper sulfate up in the mortar and pestle, you're just changing the size of the material, not actually changing the composition. Okay, conservation of mass. So we talked about this in class the other day. Um, when you're looking at this, what I would look at keywords like mixing or mixed, um, combined. These are key words that tell you that you're dealing with a reactant. When you're talking about product, you may see the term yield or formed. Those are good keywords for finding out what the um, substance is. So I would identify the reactants first, then the products. Obviously, you want to add up all the masses for the reactants, and you may have to subtract it from the products to get the missing product that you're trying to solve. Okay, definite proportion or composition. Um, please remember I talked about the fact that water always has a speci specific mass ratio. So it's about 11 to 88. So it should be the same throughout no matter how big the sample is, no matter where you get the sample is. Please remember when you calculate the mass percent, the mass of the element is on the top, the compound is on the bottom. And you may, if you're not given the mass of the compound, you may have to add up the individual masses of the element to get the overall mass of the compound. And you will divide that by, I'm sorry, you will multiply that by 100. Okay, it's my last slide, or second to last slide, I think. Um, we need to look at separation of mixtures. So notice that filtration is the very first one. Um, typically use a filter paper with a funnel. You need to separate out a solid with a liquid. So if you have a, a solid that is not soluble in that liquid, this is a great technique for separating out a material. With distillation, you need to have a difference in boiling point. So if you notice that one has a higher boiling point than another, 
you can usually boil off the lower boiling point substance and the higher boiling point substance will stay liquid. And this is just a good way to separate two liquids. Crystallization. So crystallization, you have a solid that's dissolved in a liquid. And if you remove a good portion of the liquid and you're left with like a residue that is still dissolved in the liquid, you can let it evaporate over time and you'll be left with a solid material. And that, lastly, there's sublimation. So sublimation, you need to have a substance that's able to, to skip a phase. So it can go from a solid to a gaseous phase. Um, mothballs are a good example of this. Dry ice is a good example of this. So what happens is you collect the gas and you leave behind the residue and you're able to separate them out based on their um, physical properties.